All right. Today we're going to be talking about the issue that many are familiar with. And we're kind of refreshing our minds. I always believe in going over. I said always believe. I, I very much believe in going over my software. <laughs> Going over first principle issues. If you notice today that uh, a lot of the reasons why the Lord's church is split, and a lot of the reasons why we are not fellowshipping or that we are not allowed to fellowship denominations, is because of doctrinal matters, obviously. That's what divides us doctrinal issues. And, but unfortunately, the very issues that divide us are mostly, if you notice, are very basic, fundamental things. So we're not, and let me go and put this mic on. So, okay, after I go looking for it, now I gotta let me use it. <laughs> sorry, just sorry, right quick. All right. I hope this uh, ad is gone. And, well, I'll just not mute button on this thing. It's just on off the road. Well, is that, is that, let me just go ahead and try to do it here then, I guess. I mean, would that make a difference? Or, I can just go ahead. This mic here yeah. work? Okay. Okay. Just do it like this. That's better. All right. Sorry. I guess I can take this off for now. Excuse me. Okay. Let's put this right back here. All right. Now, what I was saying was, what I was saying was, the uh, the issues that divide us are the uh, the fundamental things. If you notice, though, that's why you know the very entrance into the church, you know, the the plan of salvation. Those are the things that are first steps in the life of someone who's wanting to now become a Christian, a child of God. They first need to learn how to become a Christian. I mean, why talk about how to tame your tongue? Why talk about, uh, you know, uh, how to handle the Lord's money? Uh, how to, you know, give, you know, things like that. Why do you, you know, stress those things when first thing, you know, the person, first thing they need to know is learn how to even become a Christian, learn how to get saved, first of all. Then we can talk about the things that come, that come after that. But first, let's get you convinced of salvation and how to get there. And those basic things are constantly the main issues that separate us from everyone else. Everyone, the, the common teaching of the day for salvation, of course, is salvation by faith alone. And, you know, some people say, you know, sinner's prayer. Some people say you don't have to do that. All you have to do is believe. Some people say that you don't have to do anything. You're just saved, you know, because God loves you. And... Um, you know, these are fundamental things, and Christians, you know, these are going to be the things that we have to confront when we go out into the workplace, when we go out with family members, because, you know, some of us, you know, me for one, I'm the only Christian in my family. Uh, my, my family's religious, some of them, but they're not, uh, they're not Christians. So when I talk to them about Bible or religion at all, it's about salvation, it's about the Lord's church, proper worship. That's the, the, that's the things that are, that are really the main issues of dividing, or of, of, of division among us. And Christians are going to constantly need to know, brethren, we're going to have to know how to answer and how to explain and how to defend the truth on basic things. And what I don't want to have happen is, which I think I might have seen, you know, from not here necessarily, I'm just saying, but just in the past, is that I don't want to come across, what I fear is that brethren over time developing the attitude of, well, we already know that. We've already learned that. Let's, I want to hear something else. Tell me something I haven't heard before. You know, when it comes to Bible classes, that's, that's a bad attitude to have. Because the next thing you know, you come around, you won't know how to use the scriptures like you once did in defending the truth regarding certain matters. I'm telling you, that's the way it works. You don't use it, you lose it. You get rusty, as they say. If you don't learn how to properly defend the Bible against faith alone, or against, you know, trying to show the essentiality of water baptism, or show from the Bible how the Bible does not authorize mechanical instruments and music in worship, 
you have to constantly stay on top of those things because people are going to come up with different arguments, they're going to come up with different approaches, and they may pull up something you haven't heard before. So it's good that we constantly remind ourselves and keep our minds fresh on how to explain these things to people because these are the basic things that we're going to have to get across to them first before we go on to other issues. And one of the things I want to talk about too, well, with you all today is the idea of miracles. Because the other day, um, I, was, I was at the gym, a guy up there, uh, a couple guys rather, we got into a discussion about miracles. And, you know, I said, well, surprise, surprise. I mean, we didn't get into a discussion of, you know, uh, of any other issue, uh, of, of, of a more of a, uh, uh, in, like how to, you know, you know, the qualifications of elders. We didn't get into that, really. We got into the idea of miracles, which is, a, 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 again, a dividing matter over some, you know, over the Pentecostal church. And the reason why I said it is because these guys, this particular gentleman, went to the Potter's house in Dallas, where there were T.D. Jakes preachers, and he said he used to be a member of a Baptist church, but he and his wife, she didn't want to go to his church, so they ended up agreeing to go to T.D. Jakes, where he goes. And I said, so you left a church that taught there were no miracles, and he said, yeah, to, and you went to a place that says there are miracles now. And he was like, right. And I was like, so which one is it? You didn't leave the Baptist church because you didn't like it. You said you left it because you and your wife had to agree on a place. And it's like, well, some people out there, they don't care. They don't care, well, this place teaches this. This says, this says no to what they say. And it's like they just don't care about finding out who's right or wrong. They're just like, well, I'm happy over here. I'm happy over there. But we started getting on this matter. The point is it's a fundamental issue. And I was trying to convince him that miracles do not occur today. And that's something that I had to, you know, okay, you know, I didn't have my Bible in my hand at the moment, but I had to be ready to say, okay, let me think, what, you know, what are, what does the Bible say? Let me go over my mind and start pulling, you know, pull out my little filing cabinet in my head and, you know, start remembering what the Bible says about these things and so I can present to him, you know, convincing. Remember we said earlier, preach the word, convince or reprove. It was time for me to convince this guy that miracles don't occur or at least give him something to think about. So, Today I want us to look at uh, a verse in the Bible and I want us to run our minds over this again and look at it and, you know, of course you've learned this before, but you always hear it something different and whenever another guy gets up, now, I've never taught you all this verse before or this passage, so you, I'm sure I'm bound to say something that Sean has not said or just, you know, say something that you all like, hmm, I never thought about that before, so, you know, there's always something different that can be said every time you teach it. Just like when you read Bible verses, you go over them again, like, oh, I never thought about that before. But you knew the verse. But you're like, oh, yeah. Okay, I see how I can apply that in this sense, too. Same thing. That's why it's good to go over these things over and over again. So, if you want, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. This is one we're going to be looking at. There's two, two essential passages, I think, that powerfully teach <clears throat> that miracles no longer occur today. One of them is the one I just talked about now. 1 Corinthians 13, and Sean, of course, did the, uh, he was doing a Sunday morning uh, class on Corinthians, wasn't he? This very class. He's in 2 Corinthians now, but I remember last, last time we were here, when we came that one Sunday morning, a few, like a month or a month and a half ago, he was in 1 Corinthians uh, 6 or 7, 6, I think. Anyways, so I'm sure he went over this not too long ago, so that would be good, uh, in a sense. Maybe your minds are somewhat fresh on it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to be looking at specifically verses 8 through 13. And this is a very strong text that shows, biblically, the cessation of miracles, that miracles do not occur today. Now, the other passage, if you just want to jot this down, I don't think we'll have really time to get to it. The other passage that is good to use as a partner, as a companion a passage to, uh, to, to argue alongside of 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, is Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 as well, basically lays, sets forth the same concept and it has a different approach, but it's the same teaching, though, that, that miracles were to cease after a certain point. That is, when the full revelation had been revealed, the complete revelation of the New Testament had been revealed and confirmed. Now, let's just go ahead and read the text. 1 Corinthians 13, and of course, you know, this is no longer a worship service. This is, you know, a class, so if you have any questions or whatever, you want to get into a discussion, whatever, you know, raise your hand. Let's talk. Let's get some discussion going. This is good stuff. I mean, I just, you know, I, I, like, to, I like to get into discussion about the text. You know, it's really good. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Love never fails. New King James once again. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. 
For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Okay. That's it right there. And just that's the text at a glance at, you know, what it says. We know what it says. It's always good to, you know, condition our minds, you know, be familiar with what it was talking about. And understanding the background here, remember the church of Corinth was, uh, they, they had questions toward, uh, for Paul. They had dividing issues. And Paul writes to show them in this particular context that they're divided over temporary matters. Y'all are fighting and fussing over, over gifts. You know, ask, you know, y'all want to speak in tongues and y'all over here want to prophesy. You, you know, y'all are trying to speak, you know, those who are speaking in tongues, he goes into verse, uh, chapter 14. Some people were just going out and speaking in tongues with no interpreter present. They were just basically showing off what they could do and all that. He's saying, y'all are divided over these issues that are merely temporary. Gifts were not to be permanent in the church. And he's saying, y'all divide over these things, which y'all should be fighting and struggling to uh, to be in, in accord over, rather, is what he says in verse 13, faith, hope, and love. These three, these are the things that y'all need to focus on, faith, hope, and love. Not tongues and, because like, he says in verse 8, the reason why is, well, prophecies, they'll fail. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Whether they're tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge, it'll vanish away. Now, let me put that to you right quick. That, of course, is not talking about knowledge in general. Like, all of a sudden, after a while, I will no longer know what 10 times 10 is. That's talking about miraculously revealed knowledge that was given to people. This is talking about miraculous gifts. So there's a miraculous sense here, not just knowledge in general. Okay? <clears throat> now, what we're going to look at here is, you know, the denominations, what we're supposed to seek today, rather, is faith, hope, and love. Denominations seek faith, hope, love, and gifts as well. They seek gifts. They throw gifts on the end. They try to have that as well. That's what uh, the Pentecostals do. I passed a, uh, I didn't notice it before, but there's a United Pentecostal uh, church building on the south side of uh, 30 coming out here, about several miles back down near Rockwall, towards Rockwall. Uh, I didn't notice that. They teach gifts. They teach the Holy Spirit baptism. They teach miraculous gifts. They also teach baptism in Jesus' name in the sense that you have to say his name when you're baptized. They also teach one person in the Godhead, not, not three. That's one of the, those are the trademark uh, or the flag or the cardinal doctrines, rather, of the United Pentecostal Church. Just to give you a little quick uh, info on that. But they seek out gifts. And what they want to do is you take them to this verse, because this verse here clearly teaches that there's going to be a time when prophecies, tongues, knowledge, these things are going to vanish away. They're going to stop. Okay, that's clear from the text, and we've got to figure out when. When, in verse 9, notice this, he says, We know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now, but he says in verse 10, But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So here's our, here's our info we're giving out. Okay, now we're told when the partial is going to go away. It's when that which is perfect has come. Now, what is the common answer or the common uh, suggestion offered by those in denominations regarding what that which is perfect is? What? When Jesus comes again? That's right. They'll say when Jesus comes again, or some people have offered up the idea of heaven. When we get to heaven, uh, this is when that perfect, that's what they say the perfect is. And usually the argument is made, well, Jesus Christ was perfect. He was without sin. And therefore, that's what the Bible's saying when it says, when that which is perfect is come. And they say, that's Jesus. He's perfect. And they think that's him. Yes. What's that? Complete. You talking about perfect? Right. See, you're all on top of it. You're on top of it. You know, you, you're actually getting ahead of me there. No, that's fine. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. You, you know, because you're, I mean, like I said, this is a class. You can go ahead and say something like that. I don't mind. Uh, but, yeah, that's the idea. The, the, the idea here is, the word is translated perfect, first of all. We want to look at that. It does not carry the idea of sinlessness and like perfection in that regard as far as conduct. The word translated teleos is the word complete, like you said, or mature. 
And there's other passages which I don't have it uh, with me at the moment, but basically uh, other passages that refer to it. Matter of fact, James 1.25, when the, uh, the scriptures there talk about the perfect law of liberty. It's talking about the complete law of liberty. That's what we have in the New Testament, complete. Remember the New Testament we said a minute ago, 2 Timothy 3.16, that the man of God may be complete. It, com it makes us complete. All scripture makes the man of God complete. It's everything we need. So therefore, they are complete for us. And that's the idea here is the idea uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, that when that which is complete, that which is complete is come, then that which is in part is done away. Now, that needs to be understood. First of all, that really I think you can hang your hat right there on that, on that point right there, that the, the idea of what, com what the word perfect means. It doesn't mean sinless. It means complete. So that having that aside, the idea that we're talking about something complete versus something which is in part, now we're going to look at verse 9 where it says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. What does the in part refer to? Well, it's referring to what he said in verse 8. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When the miraculous gifts come, when, when, when they had miraculous gifts in the first century, what did those miraculous gifts allow them to do? What did tongue speaking allow them to do? What did prophesying allow them to do? What did this knowledge allow them to do? It revealed, right? Revealed God's will through these gifts. The gifts, Remember, the gifts confirmed the word, Mark 16, 20. But what did they do? They revealed God's will. Did they, every time they spoke in tongues, did they speak the entire New Testament? Every time they spoke, no. But they spoke what? Parts, pieces, sections, portions of Scripture, portions of God's will, parts of it. And see, that's what Paul is getting at in this verse here. We know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is complete has come, then that which is in part will be done away. The partial revelation will stop when the complete revelation is here. Now, this needs to be going to show as well that uh, we're going to, I'm going to show here, if you turn to Luke 11.36, I want you to go over there right quick. We're going to see an example of the idea of part and uh, uh, part and complete, the part uh, and whole being the same thing, because it doesn't make sense to say that, well, the partial refers to gifts, because see, denominations will agree, yes, the part will cease. The partial will cease, but they say it's going to cease when Christ returns. That's when they say the gifts are going to stop. But here's the thing you got to think of. The part here in 1 Corinthians 13 is being contrasted with the perfect, right? When that which is in part, or when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. There's a contrast of perfect and part. Now, the word that's translated part is the Greek word meros. Now, y'all know who Thayer is, J.H. Thayer? Okay, he's a very authoritative lexicographer. Matter of fact, he's one of most uh, regarded as one of the highest authoritative lexicographer. He basically writes a Greek dictionary showing what Greek terms mean. And uh, meros, which is translated in part, he says always contrasts uh, I, uh, objects of the same nature, part and whole. He said they always contrast things of the same nature. He said that's universal in the New Testament. In other words, wherever you see part being contrasted with a whole, the part and the whole are the same nature. In other words, if I had a cake up on this table, like a German chocolate cake, which I hate coconut. So don't ever make one for me. <laughs> the gesture is nice, but the food is not. But no, a German chocolate cake, the cake is a whole piece of cake. If I cut it up and take a slice out and say, here's a part of this cake or a piece, it's still German chocolate cake. The whole and the part are the same thing. So here's my point. If the partial revelation, if it's revelation, the, the gifts reveal part of revelation, partial revelation, that means that partial came from a whole. That whole revelation. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Back in, we said Luke 11, there's an example, and this is uh, one that was given, rather, by Mr. Thayer. In Luke 11, he gave the example here of where the term meros is used and is being contrasted. <clears throat> If you'll notice, 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, Luke chapter 11, verse 36, look what he says there. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark. You see that? No part what? 
Part of what? What's the part referring to? If your whole body is dark, is full of light, having no part dark, no part of what? What's the part referring to? Part of the body. How do you know? Because the whole, it says the whole body. So the whole is being, that you have here, is you have, you know, I wish I could use this, that would be handy sometimes to have if you had markers, but I can describe this. What's that? Oh, really? Oh, I don't think do. That's good. I'm trying to think of how I can just how I can do this right quick. Because this is this is interesting. If you have you have whole and part, right? In Luke eleven. Oops, eleven thirty six. You have a whole and a part right here, right? You have first Corinthians thirteen. Or over here you have as well, uh, you have a whole and part. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10. You have whole and part as well. Over here, well, sorry, perfect, rather I should say. Perfect and part. Let me go ahead and write perfect here. Perfect and part. Now, remember, these two terms are the Greek word meros. Perfect, or I'm sorry, part in each of these passages is the Greek term meros. Thayer says that whenever these, this is being used in contrast with a whole or a part and perfect contrast, these are always the same nature. Okay? Now, we have an example here, Luke 11, 36. The whole is told in the text. We're told that the whole refers to the body. And it says, if the whole body, right? Verse 11 or verse 36. If then your whole body is full of light. So if the body is, be, if the whole is, if we're told that the whole is referring to the body, Yet these two are of the same nature. That means the part refers to the body as well. They're the same nature. Right? Which makes sense. I mean, the text, the New King James translators even put it in italics to show you that that's, that is the obvious sense of the term. Having no part, well, it says no part dark. The whole body will be full of light. Now, the King James says, the King James would say having no part dark, the whole would be full of light. It just says the whole. Because they know that you understand that this is referring to the body. Because these two, whenever this contrast is being made, whatever one of them is, the other is the same nature as it. Now, here's one of my arguments. Here's my point. Back to 1 Corinthians 13. You have in verse 9, verse 8 rather, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. What do you know and what do you prophesy in part? You know revelation in part. You prophesy revelation in part. So if we're told over here in 1 Corinthians 13 that the part is revelation, then by definition, the contrast would say the whole has to be the same nature as the part, just like over here in Luke 11. And that's what, that's what Mr. Thayer was saying. He said whenever this contrast is made, universally, meaning always, in the scriptures, the nature is the same when you have that contrast of a part and a whole, part, whole, part, whole. The nature of the contrast is the same. See? Makes sense. You see how it follows? Now, is this, is, is, am I making this clear? Or am I, is, do you have any problems understanding what I'm saying? Or do y'all need to go back over anything on that? Okay. So that right there, I think you can show. The idea that perfect refers to complete, like you were saying earlier, and not the uh, idea of sinless, it's rather complete. It's not referring to a person who's sinless, but rather something that's complete. And then you have this idea, the contrast of first, in 1 first Corinthians 13, 9 and 10 clearly shows that if the part is referring to Revelation, then the complete or the perfect as well must be referring to Revelation, not some person. Not Jesus, but Revelation. And so therefore, he's saying when the complete Revelation has come, then that which is in part, partial Revelation, will be done away. And what was the key signs of partial Revelation? Miraculous gifts. That's how it was given, through miraculous gifts. They confirmed it. But once the war was complete, it was completely, it was, it was, it was confirmed once and for all, June 3. No longer need to confirm the word anymore. It's been confirmed. It's written down in the book. We can use the book now to prove that that's inspired. We don't need miracles to show this is God's word. You can show from reasoning and common sense and, and simple, you know, natural argumentation that this is a, this is a book from heaven. But not only does it stop there, there's, I want to look at something else. <clears throat> How much time do I have? Until. Seven more minutes? Okay, let's do this real quick. Let's jump down rather to verse 13. <clears throat> verse 13.
Verse 13. He says there, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Okay, watch this. He's comparing, when he says, and now abide, he's, refer, he's, refer, he's looking back on what he said would cease. The gifts would cease. But what's going to abide, what's going to continue, though, is faith, hope, and love. Okay? Now, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. Okay. Turn the racer. Can you right there? All right. Seven minutes time. What's on so you don't mind if I take eight or nine or 20? No, I won't take that long. <laughs> but I just want you to understand what, what, what we're getting at here. Okay. Let's see. First century right here. I'll make this point. First century right here. I'll make a little timeline. All right. First century. Gifts. They were going on back here. No problem. No one has a problem that yes, they were there. You see it in the scriptures. All right. <clears throat> Let's say this is the second coming of Christ. Second coming. Let's just say... Somewhere in here is complete rev. Complete revelation. All right. Here's a timeline, you know, first century right here. Here's where we had gifts. And we're saying, of course, obviously, some point in a long time, the complete revelation was done, because we have it now. Then, of course, somewhere down here, in the future, we're going to have the second coming. Here's another point which shows that miraculous gifts must have ceased by now. Okay, let me try to get this straight here. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These things abide now. But, look, and he said the grace of these is love, but he said the gifts would cease when uh, the second one would, release, would cease when that which is perfect has come. But, after that point, what's going to, the, when the perfect has come, the gifts will stop, and from that point, faith, hope, and love will continue. Right? All right. Here's the point. Let's see how I can do this here. You have, let's say, here's here's the Pentecostal argument right here. We'll put Pentecost. Penty. Pentecostal argument. Their point is, you've got gifts coming until the second coming of Christ. Okay? They'll say gifts. Right there. And then, <clears throat> Bible says, which we're going to say here, Bible says that gifts are going to go until the complete revelation, then they'll stop there. Now, let's just obviously where we are right now are between the time of complete revelation when it was revealed and second coming, right? We're right here somewhere. Let's just say we're here. We're here. Us. All right. The Pentecostal will say the gifts are going to continue until that which is perfect has come, and they say that's the second coming of Christ. So if the gifts are going to go until the second coming. But what happens when the gifts stop? What's going to continue? Faith, hope, and love. The gifts are going to stop, but now abides faith, hope, and love. So they say after the second coming, we'll have faith, hope, and love, right? Faith, hope, and love. They say that goes on after the second coming. But watch this. Watch. Turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. <clears throat> St. Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Are we there? Okay, notice this. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You see that? He says, when we're, in other words, the idea here is that when we're absent from the Lord, we walk by faith. Implying that when we're with the Lord, when we're there in his presence, we walk by sight. In verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the Lord and to be present. Or, I'm sorry, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the Lord and to be present. Or, I'm sorry, I keep getting that messed up. For absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He would be rather, you know, with the Lord in his sight and present with him and absent from the body. But he says, knowing that while we are at home in the body, verse 6, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, before, in this life now, before the Lord's coming, we walk by faith. Implying that when he comes, faith will end. If Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so faith is going to stop, right, at the second coming. It's going to end then because then it will be sight. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 
6 through 8, we just saw in Hebrews 11, 1. Okay? Faith will stop at the second coming. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. And look at verse 24 and 25. You there? All right. <clears throat> Romans 8, 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Ah, we see that? Hope that is seen is not hope. Now what are we hoping for? What is our hope? Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life. What's Jesus going to give to those when he comes back at his judgment? Matthew 25-46, to those who are the righteous, he's going to give eternal life. So we'll have it when he gets back. So it'll be no longer hope, because we'll see it, we'll have it. Hope will end at the second coming. Romans 8, 24 and 25. Okay? Romans 8, 24 and 25. And then you have Titus 1, 2. As I said just a moment ago. Now, does anyone see the problem here? If gifts go until the second coming... If that, if that which is, if this is the perfect according to Pentecostals, that means the part will go until the second coming, and then we'll continue faith, hope, and love. But we've shown from the scriptures that faith and hope will end at the second coming. So that means this is false. The gifts can't go all the way to the second coming. They have to stop somewhere prior to it. And here is what I'm saying: if they stop prior to, let's just say they stop when the complete revelation is given. Let's say that's when gifts stop, and faith and hope continue to the second coming like the Bible says that fits the scriptures faith, hope, and love will continue when the member says these will cease but now abide see that's what the scriptures teach right here gifts would stop at the complete revelation that's why we don't see them today that's one of the first hand proofs right there but you see that makes sense. Their position makes no sense. It, does, it, it goes against what the scriptures say. They say, well, the faith and hope will continue after it actually stops, at the point it stops. So it shows you that 1 Corinthians 13 does not teach their position, rather it teaches the truth of the matter, and that is, miraculous gifts stop at the complete revelation. And that from that point on, we have today faith, hope, and love. We walk by faith, the scriptures. And we have hope. We wait for hope of eternal life. We're waiting for that time. That's the hope we have. And we walk by faith until that time. And, of course, the grace of Jesus, love for one another, for God, for fellow man. Those three things is what you know we operate on for now. Love for, for God, love for our fellow man, walking by faith, doing what the Bible says, and waiting for the hope of eternal life, which Jesus is going to give out at his second coming, Matthew 25, 46. Not that these gifts are going to continue today. That's very clear. I think you can show that. I think that's very... You can demonstrate these two issues from 1 Corinthians 13. The idea that, uh, like you said, the perfect refers to something complete, not sinless. The comparison of part and perfect shows that whatever is in part has to be the same nature of that which is perfect. Revelation. And then showing... That since faith, hope, and, uh, faith and hope will abide after the part ceases, well, the part then can't, the gifts can't be going until the second coming because faith and hope will be stopped at that point. So the gifts have to stop somewhere prior to, excuse me, the second coming. And tying that in with the fact that the perfect is the complete revelation, that's when the part stops. And since the gift stops, all we've had then is faith, hope, and love. And that's what we're continuing. Yes. Uh huh. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Right. Evidence of things not seen. Mm hmm. Right. Exactly. Things not seen. So what happens when we hear? Right. We'll see him as he is. First or First John three, uh, two or three. <clears throat> right. That's that. Any questions? Any uh, comments or anything like that? But see, the reason I'm saying this is it's good to know these things, folks, because 
you know, there are so many people who believe this stuff. They believe this right here. They think it's true. And, and all it, what it is is they're told this by the preachers, and they don't take the time to do with what we're doing right now. To diagram it right on the board, look at these things compared to other scriptures, and say, hmm, you know what? This really doesn't fit. Remember that God is a reward of those who diligently seek him? You have to study the scriptures. You have to, you have to look and study. Don't let nobody, don't let anybody, nobody tell you what the Bible says. Look for it for yourself, you know. That's why I'm putting these up here. I want you to think, you know, I could take all these scriptures off and say, well, here it is, folks. That's how it is. Well, how do you know that, Steve? Because of this right here. I know faith and love are going to stop because God said it would. God implied that it would in these texts here. So that, I think, can show. Those, those three points, the complete, the definition of, of perfect, rather, the part perfect contrast issue, and this right here, what abides, faith and hope of abiding, those three things, I think, are just a open and shut case to show that that passage in 1 Corinthians 13 demands that miraculous gifts do not occur today. Now you just got to say, are they willing to go by what the scriptures say or not? Which most of the time, a lot of time with Pentecostal groups, they're like, well, no, I feel this and that. And it's like, well, you got to get down to, you know, you got to get this authority set first. So, all right. Well, I enjoyed it. That was uh, enjoyable. I mean, it's good. Uh, I like doing all that stuff. It's good to do. It's good to use and good to remind ourselves. Take it. Tell your friends. Tell your workers. Those who believe that stuff, tell them. Tell them, tell them, tell them. All right. We'll go ahead and stop there, I guess. Thanks for y'all's participation.